kid. Seriously. Welcome to another wintry, wonderful episode of the Kids Seriously Show, the only podcast around that never waits until the fourth quarter to start playing defensively. Every now and again, we get together to discuss the world, play our famous trivia question game show, discuss other things from Nerdland that might tickle our fancy, and once in a while, we're going to review something, too. To my left, it's everyone's favorite young buck. It's Luke Neitzel. And to my right, way to my right, it's the old stag himself. It's Mark Neitzel. And me, I'm Maya Madrid in the Middleton with you. Gentlemen, how are you? I am good, and it sounds like somebody was at a Bucks game, because that sounded like a lot of Bucks references. <laughs> Wow, this is this is an NBA week for us since I was at the the Trailblazers game last week or last Friday. So nice, nice. Well, we'll just have to have all NBA talk. Yeah, we're we're gonna be, yeah, we're gonna be we're gonna the, the NBA here pretty soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They they dribble a ball. It's fun. I'm good. How are you, Maya? How's your time been? I'm good. I'm good. I went to the Pfizer Forum like uh, you had pointed out. It was Boom's Christmas present. Oh, awesome. And my wife was really, really into the game, like talking strategy. And it's been my dream to have somebody talk about the NBA with me. Like it's for whatever reason, I'm always in in every group I'm in the one person who likes the NBA. So for her to like get as much out of it, um, or she asked if she could go to like two or three games every year now. Um, Awesome. It was, it was absolutely wonderful. There were the, the stadium is just unbelievable. They have greeters everywhere that are super nice. And I don't know why that's such a big deal to me, but they were just like everywhere you looked, it was like somebody like willing to help you. Boom got to meet some of the cheerleaders and got a per picture with them, which was cool. And um, it's the best food that I ever had at any sporting event. The food was unbelievable. What, what day of the week did you go? We went uh, Friday. Okay, that's right. So I had this question because I noticed that they have a Chick Fil A there, and like the Bucks yes. must play Sunday games. So does the Chick Fil A booth close on Sundays? I guess it. I guess it has to, right? You would think, but like, why would the Fi Serve allow that then? <laughs> you would think they would have the cachet to be like, no, you're gonna stay open because we play games on Sundays. <laughs> well, probably because they get the the marketing tag of we have a chick-fil-a in our stadium i suppose but we probably make up for money on the other six days out of the week we, we have enough chick-fil-a's in milwaukee that i don't think anyone's going to the game exclusively to get chick-fil-a but maybe it makes it makes enough money the other six days of the week oh and by the way maya i, I realize yeah. you don't have a lot of people to talk to the nba about but if you ever want to have an in-depth discussion about just how awesome the warriors are um, I'm, I'm happy to do that because they're, they're my NBA team now and we're really awesome. And I, I would love to discuss that with you constantly. That's fine. I can't wait until the playoffs when my Lakers upset the Golden State Warriors. It's going to be phenomenal. It's going to be a big year for LA. The Rams will win the Super Bowl. And the, it's, it's t- coming Whoa, up all LA. Uh, the Rams aren't even an LA team. They're an Anaheim team. Let's get this trip. Uh, they're playing in Inglewood, and uh, I I may have only been in LA for a few hours, but I did see Pulp Fiction, and that's where Samuel L. Jackson lived in Pulp Fiction. So it must be pretty LA. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> hey, should we do something? <laughs> we should. Let's get right to Giannis Antetokounmpo's favorite game show. It's Am I Right or Am I Wrong? In true American style, our contestants are going to offer up their earnest opinions, which will either be taken as fact or immediately mocked by our moderator, who today is Mark Neitzel. Here's how the two-player version of our game works. There's seven questions. Each baller goes back and forth in a serpentine way, not unlike a story from Rudy Giuliani. Winner gets four. To win, you must get four. Tonight, moderator, as I said, it's our new champion, Mark Neitzel. So it's going to be a throwback match between Luke and myself. Mark, take it away. All right. Strap in, gentlemen. So I'm going to play around with the order a little bit because um, we were just recently talking about the NBA. And I am blessed to have never really been an NBA fan before now because that meant when I started cheering for the Warriors, I wasn't jumping on a bandwagon because I didn't have a previous established team, but I was abandoning just in order to embrace a a great team. Uh, I was able to get in what for me was the ground floor. So it's really awesome that uh, my NBA team is is so 
dominant over you know teams that like say Maya cheers for, for instance. So in that vein, um, you know, the teams that we do cheer for by and large are not even really our own choices. Uh, they're the product of where we were born, who our parents were, the, the friendships we had, and that's how we come into them. So my question for both of you is if you could go back in time, knowing what you know now, go back in time and pick a team to be a fan of instead of the team you're a fan of currently so that you could say, you know, I've always been a fan of uh, Utah Jazz, right? If you could go back in time and pick a new team to have been a fan of from the ground floor, who would you pick and why? And again, we're going to go with any of the five uh, major leagues and we'll also allow college teams too. Who goes first? I don't even know. No, normally it's clearly defined who goes first. I don't know this time. Maya goes you first. Go first. Oh. No, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm running this game. I, I say Maya goes first. Okay. Um, I think for me, if I could switch one, this is a very good and difficult question. You know, I'd be tempted to maybe get out of all the misery that I've had as a Cubs fan, um, but I'm not going to pick that. I think, you know, despite all my my changes and all the changes of the teams that I've liked in MLS, I've been legendary with how much I've been switching, second only to Luke. Um, I think I would, if I could just pick anybody, I'd cheer for FC Dallas. I For whatever reason, whenever I watch them, I have a great time. And I think Dallas really needs the fan support because <laughs> they have no fans. So I think maybe that would be kind of a match made in heaven. And uh, they, they just play the game like I enjoy watching like I think is effective and, and I like the way that they do their youth system. And so I'm going to go the first team that popped in my head, FC Dallas. So I'm going to go for glory, which is going to immediately knock FC Dallas out of the conversation because most of the teams I cheer for don't win championships other than Arsenal. I mean, the fire won one in 98, but I was a clash fan back then, even though I, I watched that MLS cup and was cheering for the fire because everyone wanted DC to end their dynasty. Um, you know, the Twins won a couple World Series back when I was a kid, but that was a long time ago. I've never seen, you know, a Minnesota team win the Stanley Cup or the Super Bowl or an NBA championship, even though I'm, I'm not a big NBA fan. So, you know what? No team has probably given me more actual heartbreak than the Vikings. So I'll just make me a Patriots fan, man. Give me those Super Bowl rings. Like, I'm going to take the glory 100% of the time. And, you know, I, I feel Patriot fans... It's also funny, too, because, I mean, the Patriot fans, they were in the same boat that, you know, Mark, you and I are as Vikings fans, where they were kind of a, a team who was, you know, always would make the Super Bowl and lose it and screw things up and couldn't win and had no luck. And now they're maybe the greatest franchise in the history of the NFL. So just g give me rings. Give me glory. I'm going Patriots. Heard of the question a little more. FC Dallas is an interesting choice, but I don't feel like you really have a strong enough MLS team that you can't be a fan of FC Dallas as you clearly already are Maya. So I just, yeah, you are, you know, we, we could hear the longing in your voice. You're a fan. <laughs> so um, my answer, and there wasn't actually a technically right or wrong one because this is ultimately a very personal question. Mine was going to be Chelsea. Uh, because pretty much for the same reasons Luke says, and it would have saved me a lot of heartbreak over cheering for Everton. And I still would have had one of the men in blazers in my corner. So I would have gone with Chelsea, but Luke gets the point. It is one, nothing. Okay. Question number two, this one goes to Luke first. So recently my wife and I were on Netflix looking for something to watch and we found old reruns of cheers thought, hey, this would be a good show to you know, pop on kind of in the background in some of our downtime. We don't have anything really big that we're watching. And I got about three episodes into the season where Rebecca's there and realized, wow, Sam's actually kind of rapey and creepy. And there's a lot of jokes in this that I'm not entirely comfortable with knowing what I know now. So this got me thinking, I don't have children. 
but you both do, and I have relationships with them to varying degrees. And eventually, these kids are going to see some of the, the pop culture, the media that we consumed, and we're probably going to be pretty embarrassed by it with uh, modern sensibilities. So my question to you, and it starts with Luke, is what piece of, of pop culture media are you most mortified to find your kids or to have your kids find out that you liked? Uh, for, so for, for me, it would be if they went back. I, I liked the first couple Eminem albums when I was 20 and, you know, 19, 18. And in, in college, just getting out of high school into college. And I'm, have heard some of those songs again recently and just the, the glaring homophobia and sexism and violence towards women and everything about it. I find completely reprehensible and unlistenable. The only, the only song his I can even listen to is the, the lose yourself one. That's just more like a sports pump up anthem type song. Like his stuff is horrible. And I don't, I don't buy the, Oh, I'm playing a character or whatever. Yeah. Maybe you're playing a character, but you're, you're, you're extruding, those values or lack of values just to profit with that character. I, I don't see a redeeming quality in it. You have nothing to say socially with any of those statements. It's shock for the sake of shock value. And it's really horrible stuff, in my opinion. Maya? I'm going to switch gears here and go facts of life. Um, <laughs> I was a huge facts of life fan because I loved Michael J. Fox. And in that show, he was a young conservative and if you know Boom, uh, Boom is an unbelievably politically active eight-year-old. She's been to political uh, rallies and really, really cares about politics. She watches the news, um, at least what will let her watch. And it will be very embarrassing when she realizes that my favorite show when I was her age was about a, a young Republican. A show you loved so much you didn't even get the name right. Oh, is it? What's that? Oh. What's that? It's Family Ties. Family Ties, that's it. Yeah, Fex Love is a different one. Yeah. Luke you, Luke, you just walked all over my giving you the other point in that I was with Maya in that he was he he got closest to my correct answer, but he couldn't get the name of the show <laughs> right. Facts of Life is with Tootie and Molly Ringwald and this is And scary. George Clooney. Dude, and George Clooney. 30 years. Yeah. The, the actual correct answer, um, and I, I actually, I don't know if this pertains to Maya because I don't know if Maya consumed it, but I, I, I feel like this would be for both Luke and I is Night Court. <laughs> 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 because if, if, if you think about that, um, there's a lot of stuff in there that probably never should have been put on TV. Um, you know, I, I know Luke and I used to chafe at some of my mom's restrictions about what we could and couldn't watch. And that was one of the shows she banned. And you know what? She actually probably was right about that one. <laughs> she may have so, had a point. Um, the, the, the true correct answer is Night Court. Look, Maya, you went with a sitcom. I was going to give it to you. You, you dropped the name. I, I can't do it. Luke gets the point. So we're up uh, 2 nothing here, Luke. And the, the question now goes to Maya. So right now, while we're doing this podcast for our dozens and dozens of listeners, there are I dozens of us. I am missing the Royal Rumble, which is currently airing on the WWE Network, which I pay for because I haven't figured out how to cancel it. <laughs> so we've discussed wrestling in the past, and we've clearly established that Mr. Perfect is the greatest wrestler of all time. But gentlemen, I want to know, what is the worst wrestling gimmick of all time? And what I mean by gimmick is not necessarily that the wrestler himself was a bad wrestler, but was playing a terrible character. And there's tons of options here. So I want you to dig deep, go into your vast reservoir of knowledge. Maya, you're on the board. Well, there are so many to choose from. Um, who could forget the Mountie gold... Uh, was that guy Gold Dust or whatever the hell his name is? Yeah. Doink is pretty bad. Um, a lot of there, there's just been so many just racist ones, but I'm gonna go with just a weird one. And the one that I always hated was the Repo Man. <laughs> um, the Repo Man's gimmick is he would come and and take uh, people's stuff when they 
when they didn't uh when they didn't pay the bills on time that was his gimmick and like he had like a a little like like i don't know like the hamburglar mask <laughs> and so i was he like I mean, but- even when i was like nine i was like this is this is stupid. This is the dumbest thing. Wasn't he like balding? Like, didn't he look like the the fast talking guy who did micro machine commercials too? Like? John Machina. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. So, I the first thing that popped into my head is not the answer I'm going to go with because uh, I, I while Maya was talking, I actually thought of one I think is better. But initially, I was going to say before they really you know figured out what to do with Kane, his gimmick was as an evil dentist named uh, Isaac Yankum, I believe Isaac. D. Yankum, something like that, which is pretty terrible. But I am going to have to give it to IRS, because not only was IRS a terrible, cheesy, horrible villain, you know, he came in and basically with slicked back hair, basically doing the Michael Douglas suspenders look from Wall Street, but he also had an overtly racist name when you said it all out loud that was offensive to people who may, you know, not believe in Jesus. So, um... I'm going to go with a combo of being just a goofy, dumb bastard of a character, along with uh, not-so-subtle racism. Oh, oh! both of those are excellent answers. They're not the answer I had, which was, of course, Tugboat. What? <laughs> a, a man whose entire gimmick is a pirate hat and going, toot, toot, is just about as bottom of the barrel as you can get. Um, oh, but, you know, like, when he betrayed Hulk to become... What was it? Tidal wave or tsunami or it was it was a typhoon. Ty- typhoon. Yeah. So he could be a natural disaster with an earthquake because they were like, we'll just put the two fattest, beardiest guys together. Yeah. That that um, that hurt. Um, I'm I'm giving the point to Maya. Luke, your answer is probably better, but the Hamburglar line got. Me. <laughs> and now now I can only think of him you know, creeping around like the Hamburglar with a big sack over his back. So um, yeah. So Maya gets the point. Luke, you're up. It's two to one. Okay. This one goes to Luke, and and I apologize in advance, Maya. This one's probably kind of in his wheelhouse. But um, it was recently announced that Christopher Nolan's next film is going to be released on July 20th, 2020. Now... The only things we know about it are that, A, it's a Christopher Nolan movie, B, that it's going to be released on July 17th, 2020, and C, it's about an event. So the question is, what is this movie going to be about, Luke? I, I was so ready for you to say C, it's going to be an hour and a half longer than it needs to be. Um <laughs> Uh, it's going to be about an event. I heard he was releasing a movie, but I didn't know it was uh, going to be an event. So I'm, I'm going to go more with what I am hoping for because I think that I really like Christopher Nolan. I like, you know, Memento is one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, the You know, the, the Dark Knight is amazing. Batman Begins is amazing. I enjoyed in, Insomnia and following and a lot of the stuff he does. But I think he's gotten... He's gotten a little too big in his concepts. As I mentioned, his movies have gotten too long. I'd like to see him do more of like kind of a, a, a taunt thriller type more, more in the, in the realm of insomnia or, or memento. So I'm going to say if it's going to be a event related, I want it to be around and maybe there's just some, some personal fantasizing as well in this. I want it to be around a presidential assassination. I want it to be that type of a event. Okay. Interesting choice. Maya. Well, there's a couple things that we know about Christopher Nolan, some of which you mentioned, uh, but you didn't mention one other thing is that this movie is going to be sure to be highly overrated and smug as hell, like all of his most recent films. So um, he's going to go big or go home. And since he already did the big event for the Brits, he's not going to do a big event for America bigger than political assassinations. I'm betting he's going to do September 11th, 2001. That would be my bet. Um, so he can put, you know, his, his stamp on um, the biggest event that ever happened during this generation's lives. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay. So while I disagree with Maya, because I think Paul Greengrass pretty much 
did September 11th as good as you're going to do it with Point 90 or United 93. Um, you did at least pick an actual event, whereas Luke just came up with a scenario. So I am giving the point to Maya. The actual answer, my guess, is he's doing the story of Jonestown. I have no information to base that upon. It's just what I'm going with in my gut, but there we go. So, Amaya, uh, again, you didn't hit the bullseye, but you got closer to the mark, so you're getting the point there. Gentlemen, we're tied 2-2. Two, two. How are you feeling right now? Are, are you? It's weird how that always seems to happen. <laughs> Isn't it, though? Crazy. Okay. Question number five. The Oscars have been announced, and I, there are, are eight pictures up for Best Picture this year. My wife and I are currently working our way through these films. I want to know what you think is the biggest oversight in the nominations for the 2019 Academy Awards. And Maya would be first. It's odd. And Maya would be first. Oh, gosh. Um... Spider-Man Into the Universe for Best Picture. I have no idea what's even been nominated, but I'm just going to go there and shoot from the hip. It was my favorite movie that wasn't nominated this year and so for Best Picture. And so I'm going to say that. Well, I, I know nothing about movies. So. I, well, don't worry. You're going to get you're going to get the point cuz I I am going to go with what I I really think and I, I don't think it'll I know it won't be the written down answer. But for me, I thought Hereditary was the the best movie of the year. It was beautifully shot, it was slow burn, it was terrifying. It it had a a message beyond just we're trying to scare you, which is about mental illness and how that can pass down from family to family and destroy generations of people. The movie itself should have been nominated for me as a best picture, but what's even more egregious is how good Tony Collette was in the, the lead role. So I, I would have loved to have seen her got nominated for best actress, but for hereditary to not even be mentioned in any of the categories is uh, a massive, massive oversight to me. Luke, that is a brilliant, well-reasoned, and argument. I, I thank you for making it. But if this game has one rule, it's that if you write something down and it gets guessed, you have to give them the point. And yes, Maya, I had written down Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse for Best Picture simply because I think what that has done with animation and the innovation that was shown in that film it is so far beyond what we've seen. And I guarantee you that for the next 10 years, every animated movie is going to look like that one. So it's, it's impact I think is going to be tremendous. So that was the answer I had. Luke, you made a better argument, but rules are rules. Pressure's on. Yeah. Okay. Maya, you're up three to two. And, and there is no way at all. Luke is going to get this question right and force it to a, a, a tiebreaker. Never. So, um, going back to TV shows, and uh, for some of you who may have noticed, and judging by the numbers, it actually is a couple of you, uh, we have been covering the latest season of True Detective. And this is a show that's had kind of an interesting arc in that the first season was one of the most critically acclaimed and popular things to come around in years. Whereas the second season absolutely crashed and burned into a horrible muddle mass confusion and is only now kind of being redeemed with this ongoing uh, third episode that or third season that is showing a market increase. So my question to you gentlemen is historically a TV show. What TV show has had the biggest drop off in quality from year one through the end? Oh, through the end. So not, not just, a, a second season not just that... so not like true detective not just uh you know good okay. season oh or bad season th and... thank god because i knew my answer for that would immediately get me disqualified if it was like drop off from season one to season two because i'd pick the wire because i don't like season two of the or wait is it season three no no it's season two of the wire i don't like and i knew that you don't would... like and yes you would have lost yeah and you wouldn't have even bothered with another question yeah yeah so which which show started out really well and had the biggest decline it's gonna take him a while um and stuff I'm ready 
Oh, are you ready? I'm Damn. ready. I'm in trouble because I am. I am come. Oh, I, I also don't think this is going to get me the points. But uh, it's Arrested Development. I think I think season four and five are unwatchable. I I think they're horrible. I the the not having all the cast together in season four destroyed it. The episodes were too long. Uh, I think a little bit too much time had passed. I and then to redo this other one, it it still wasn't funny. It still wasn't interesting. You had the horrible things come out about Jeffrey Tambor and then uh, Justin uh, Bateman embarrassing himself trying to defend him. That that whole thing just completely fell apart. I think if it was if you look at it as just the first three seasons, it's in there for the best comedy ever made. But when you look at it as a whole, it it drops way down in comparison to some other shows. I you know I look at a, a show like It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which is still funny and innovative and changing after like thirteen years, compared to how quickly Arrested Development for me went in the the toilet after it was initially canceled by Fox. Okay, so we have uh, Arrested Development from Luke. Maya, well, what say you? I think Arrested Development is a fine answer, and um, there's a lot of merit to what Luke is saying. But I think a, an even bigger drop-off over a longer period and higher highs and lower lows is The X-Files. After David Duchovny, that show was god-awful and terrible, and they kept that franchise going and going and going and I've never been as delirious of a fan as I was for that show and for that to be ripped for me and to ruin my love of that show down that dark, dismal uh, drainage of, of fandom was just a terrible experience for me and the rest of the American people, frankly. <laughs> and, um, I, you know, I hate to relive it, but, you know, the game's game and we got to go out to try to win. Luke, when you're hot, you're hot, and when you're cold, you're cold, because I have written down the X Files. Well, in in fairness, you know, I I can't say that a, a show I never liked declined. So, well, that that is true. <laughs> and and while I actually I agree with everything you've said about Arrested Development, the only thing for me that kept it is that I view it as honestly as two different shows because it stopped for so long. And it's season four and five are actually more of a reboot for me. Whereas the X-Files, it was on the air constantly through those 13 seasons. Was it 13 seasons? God almighty. Isn't it um, still going? Or well, like they, back they're again? Doing the reboot now, but that went over like a lead balloon. And so that's failed too. But yeah, it, so because in my absolutely hit it, that there was a show that was so brilliant and innovative and then just become a repetitive dreck of copying itself over and over again until it was like a, a Xerox without toner. Um, it, it, you both made compelling arguments, but Maya, you took the point. You know what that means, buddy. It's my first win over Luke. It's true, but it you is. better, you better give us question seven just for the hell oh, You'll get question seven. Don't worry. It'll just be for shits and giggles at well, this yeah. point. But so I mentioned before how the wife and I are, are working our way through the uh, Oscar uh, Best Picture contenders, and we've just finished watching Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, I'm going to leave my feelings about this movie in general eh, on the table, but um, needless to say, Rami Malek does a pretty fantastic job of um, portraying Freddie Mercury. So that got me thinking that the three of us are hitting the age now where the musicians that we loved are about ready to start having biopics made of them too, much like Johnny Cash or Ray Charles or Freddie Mercury here. So I, I figure we should start looking ahead to when they start making the biopics of uh, 90s rock stars. And my question to you is when they make the first movie, who are they going to make the movie about and who do you cast in the role? And we're going from, we're going from a, we're going from like 90, 91, 92 ish on. Well, they already did. They already did straight out of Compton. So. Yeah. And so they did last days, which is basically Kurt Cobain 
with a pseudonym. Yeah, but but that but we mean actual. But it's got to be actual biopic where they're using the name and the exact you know the alleged exact stories. Um, so so that one doesn't count. Kurt Cobain's still on the table if that's the route you want to go. Well, I, th- that would be interesting, but I know two things um, that wouldn't give you the point. And two, it's not really what I'd want to see or what I think would be first. What I think would be first is not the person who was making great music in 91 and 92. It's the person who fell apart in 91 and 92. And that would be Michael Jackson. And who I would cast? Well, it's, it's my favorite actor, of course. It's uh, Donald Glover. Because Donald Glover can do no wrong in his acting chops. He could do the earlier career of Michael Jackson, and he could do the post-career. Um, so I'm going to go Donald Glover as Michael Jackson, King of Pop. Well, you know, I, I'm surprised. I thought you were going to cast Sandra Bullock, because you, you brought that up in our, our Bird Box review. And, and I know you haven't seen season two of Atlanta, but he, he does a Michael Jackson-esque thing playing a, a guy oh. named Teddy Perkins who was basically Michael Jackson in an episode of that. So he's he's already kind of done it. Um I am gonna go a, a different route than that because I think it's more of an interesting story. Uh that's probably less terrifying than a Michael Jackson story. And also you would be able to work in um a lot of these other big ninety artists who would have interacted with the band I'm going to pick. Um, I am going to pick uh, R.E.M. and a, a biac focused on Michael Stipe and what it's like to be a, you know, a gay artist in the, you know, the nineties and, and rock. And, you know, he was someone who worked with Kurt Cobain and worked with a ton of people in those nineties industries. So you'd be able to work those uh, cameos in and out. I would have really liked to have seen that. He's, he's too old and dead, but like a, a thin Philip Seymour Hoffman, I think would have been um, re- really, really good at that role. But for a couple reasons, I just mentioned that well, is, but like the fact that there is no such thing as a thin Philip Seymour Hoffman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or an alive one. And um, I was going to say that, but I'm happy you did. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, he's dead. I can't. I can't change it. <laughs> I wasn't wishing for it. Uh, but so I. I can't go with him, and and we should probably go with uh, someone a, a little younger. And I. I'm going to give this actor a, a a chance because he he. He ruined something really horribly in the past few years, but if you've seen him in The Squid and the Whale, if you've seen him in his Oscar-nominated performance, um, I think Jesse Eisenberg could do something interesting with that role, and uh, hopefully re- he could be that redeeming himself we've talked about lately uh, after his horrible, horrible Lex Luthor turn. Okay. Um, both interesting answers. Uh, both, neither one did I see coming at all. Um, my answer was actually, I thought kind of in the similar vein uh, of what Luke was saying and to go with somebody who maybe isn't the, the most predominant person, but who could brush up with a lot of really big names and also there would be a lot of drama. I went with a biopic of Courtney Love starring Jennifer Lawrence. Oh, that would be interesting. Because I thought that would be a, that would be a unique way to take on the whole kind of nineties um, grunge rock scene. I think you should award um, yourself the point on that one. Well, I I, I would. Um, and you know what? I can. So <laughs> I am going to take this point. And uh, Maya, you have officially dunked on Luke for the first time. Uh, winning it's a great feeling. Really. What was that? I, I, can't, I can't explain it. Um, I've waited for this all the way back to 1999 when I was playing wrestling video games against that bastard and couldn't beat him then and haven't been able to beat him since but it's it's you know been 20 or so years in the making almost and I'm just I'm just excited you know and excited to compete for the title next week Luke, you've had a great run, but I feel like you're entering the Don Majakowski years I was of your participation I, in this game I was gonna say I just I you know it's I know how Tom Brady feels now when he he loses to the the Eagles and just has to console himself with all his other rings. That he has his uh, Brazilian supermodel wife model for him. Well, you know, there's worse things in the world, I guess. <laughs>